Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our July Denton County Master Gardener Association meeting and program. We are so delighted today to welcome our own Sherry Ely, Denton County Master Gardener from the year of 2014. She's also a Rosarian and president of the Dallas Area Historical Rose Society, a board member of the Heritage Rose Foundation, and she is a fount of information and education and inspiration. And she's gonna teach us all about roses today, pruning them, feeding them, caring for them, and probably everything you ever wanted to know about <laughs> roses. So Sherry, thank you so much for being with us. And we welcome you and the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, as Catherine said, um, I've uh, been a master gardener for Denton County. My intern year was 2014. and uh, I've been a member of the Dallas Rose Society as a local group, serves in the DFT area, and uh, international is a group of roses from around the world, and I'm uh, happy to be a board member with that group. And I love roses. And I've been a member of the Dallas Area Historical Rose Society, I guess for about 10 years now. I've always liked history. So when it came time, um, and I love the history, not just of roses, but other plants in my gardens. I like to hear about the story of how they're collected, how they're hybridized and uh, where they come from. And I enjoy sharing that information with others. So I hope you're tucked in because I'm ready to begin my two hour talk on roses. I'm just kidding. But we had, it was really long and I kept having to reduce my talk. So we'll go through, we'll talk about what I like about old garden roses. And we're gonna do cover a little bit about the printing, feeding and care of roses. So if you don't grow roses, hopefully you'll consider growing them after uh, we discuss them. So let's talk about roses for your garden. How do you use roses for your garden? Um, I use roses as part of my landscape. They add structure, they're semi-evergreen. Um, they're a nice medium shrub. they are also ones that are, are shorter that I you can use up front in my uh, garden layout. Rare roses, um, they add continuous color to my garden. I was just talking to Catherine how, you know, we, ha we have our general growing period of spring th through summer through fall, but even in the off months, occasionally I'll have beautiful blooms from the varieties that I have. Roses, uh, when taken care of organically, can feed pollinators. And it's, it's easy to take in care of and maintain your roses organically. And my husband has said to me that his, his garden, it's, you know, it's kind of our garden, uh, is not a garden unless there's a rose in it. So even though we've had our ups and downs with uh, specifically rose rosette, we still grow roses because there's room for a rose in every garden. So, even if you don't have a garden, you can still do have roses because many varieties do well in containers. So even if you have a small area, whether it's a patio or a balcony, or you know, just uh, it, you're not really getting into gardening yet, you can try roses in containers because some varieties do very well in containers. In India, um, I've seen pictures of huge roses in these very tiny containers that uh, is a, a rose culture that they, they have in many areas there. Roses uh, have had blooms, as I said before, in my North Texas garden every month of the year. And roses are easy. And what makes them easy is if you try and grow varieties that you know do well in North Texas. I think there are many misconceptions about roses and many people think, oh, they're too difficult because you, know, you have to spray them all the time. They need routine spraying. And that's not the case. Um, I don't spray my roses. They need a generous feeding schedule. And no, they're, they're very hardy plants, but I'm not uh, giving them, I'm, they're not on a, a feeding schedule that I have. They're not uh, picky. They're not difficult to grow. And all because the adage of gardening is always about picking the right plant for the right place. And this is very true with roses. Just pick the right rose for the right place in your garden. When I, um, roses are easy when you grow old garden roses or easy care modern roses. And this is what I look for for varieties in my garden. I want low maintenance. <laughs> I'm a busy person. I'm gonna, uh, I got 
things going on, but I still, but I still want to have uh, those, those key plants in my garden, which I think roses are, but I want them to be uh, easy to maintain. I want them drought tolerant. I don't want to have to water them all the time or feel like I need, they need water because I also want to conserve water. So once your roses are established, like many plants, they might need a little help once to get going, then I, they, they mostly in my garden are drought tolerant. They provide beauty in the garden. I love the look of the roses. And I like to cut their flowers and bring them inside. My mom has said ever since I was little, I couldn't leave a plant. I couldn't leave anything blooming in the garden. I'd always grab it and bring it inside. And I still do that for, to this day when I visit. Um, I often go and we'll just find different things and forage a bouquet for the yard. It's just something I've always enjoyed doing. And um, as master gardeners, we study earth kind principles and there are earth kind roses. And the, look at the varieties of roses that are considered to be earth kind. What is earth kind? It's a, um, a study where plants are put through their paces of, of no care or little to no care. And um, they're kind of left to fend for themselves. And when these roses, this, I know the study was done in Farmer's Branch. Many of these roses went through some of the worst summers that we had, and they perhaps had to do a little, I think, watered once or twice. They weren't watered weekly or even monthly. They were put in the ground, they were mulched. And these are the really tough varieties that survive. So when you wanna look at roses, maybe you think, well, I want a really easy one. Let's look at the type that survived the earth kind rose trials. And many of these types are old garden roses. You can look at the size, and that's the nice thing about roses. They don't, they aren't one size fits all. They come in all shapes and sizes. So you can look at what size you need and, and plant accordingly. So you can have uh, dwarf shrubs, small shrubs, medium shrubs, uh, mannerly climbers or vigorous climbers. You can visit the earth kind website to uh, get more information on um, this particular, on these particular varieties. I don't know what happened. Okay, we'll just, all right. I don't Sharon, know why that I'm, marked. I'm thinking somebody probably is using their uh, whiteboard tools. <laughs> oh, okay. I was like, I, how did I just draw on that? I don't think that was you. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Well, that's all right. Let's continue. Um, what are old garden roses? The American Rose Society uh, uses the date of the first introduction of the hybrid tea which was a cross of hybrid perpetuals and tea roses. There you get hybrid tea. Uh, and they pinpoint it to a rose called La France that was introduced in 1867. So they use that as a cutoff date between old garden roses and modern roses. But there are other uh, rose organizations around the world and maybe and they're, um, when they look at old garden roses, they're, they look more at the parentage as opposed to like a, a cutoff date. So you, so, but we accept all roses. So we're not going to say it. Just because something was hybridized after 1867, we would go, oh no, that's not an old garden rose because it is. It, you know, it, was, it has the same parentage of, parentage of roses that came before that date. And, um, you know, up, so this is through the 17, 1800s and up until through World War I, up, up until the beginning of World War II, actually. I just listed these types um, just so we can. If you're not familiar with types of roses, we can look at these. And this by no means is all the types of roses. There are, there are uh, many more, but there are species roses and they're found on the five continents. So every continent except for the Arctic and Antarctica have roses. There are roses in Europe, such as the Gallica, the Damask, Alba. And uh, we can look at other roses, the Centifolia, moss roses, China and tea roses, Portland, Noisette, which is the variety that was hybridized in the United States, bourbons, hybrid perpetuals, early hybrid teas, which I'm kind of going more with that second definition of parentage as opposed to a date for roses, because some of the early hybrid teas, you look at them, you're like, well, that looks like an old variety. Uh, polyanthus, 
which actually kind of came out at the same time as early hybrid teas that, uh, and English roses, which we know are, are modern rose. And actually they came up with their own um, name for the type of roses that come from David Austin, which are English roses. Today for this talk, we're gonna talk about those varieties that do well in North Texas, specifically China's. And we're gonna talk about tea roses and polyanthus. So I keep emphasizing what I want in my garden is minimal care roses. And I want them to be pretty, I want them to be beautiful, I want fragrance. And if I put them, they can be part, they can stand alone on their own. On the left, we see Gabrielle Privé, which is a polyantha. Um, one little cutting of it, that's just one stem with the many flowers makes a bouquet. Now on the right, I have uh, the same thing, Gabrielle Privé, but I have it uh, in a different bouquet with other flowers and roses from my garden. And what's interesting is I'm not the only one that wants these type of roses. We're seeing these trends in modern, in the, in the hybridizing of modern day roses. And folks are, hybridizers are making roses that look like old roses, but have more like modern rose, uh, easy care are growing patterns. So get the best of both worlds. So let's talk about the care of your roses. Pruning your roses, some people will just, just think, oh, this is so hard. I have to cut at a 45 degree angle for my outward facing bud. But that's not necessarily, that's not true with old garden roses. Uh, some of these rules apply to roses when you, at a time, um, or to those that want to grow ex exhibition roses, roses that they put in competitions. So it's a different shrub, it's a different rose. Old garden roses are much, much more laid back. Um, you can even prune them with uh, hedge clippers. Traditionally in North Texas, we prune our roses around February 14th, which makes it easy to remember Valentine's Day, North Texas. And it not only, this is late winter, our plants are dormant. So not only are we uh, trimming up and cleaning up our roses, but there are other plants that we are trimming up and cleaning in our garden, such as salvias or artemisia. So it's part of our, our early uh, spring or late winter chores that we're attending in the garden. But, you know, this, we know this year was unprecedented in the date. So you think, well, what if something happens? I mean, why February 14th? And what would have happened to my roses if I pruned them this year? Well, I think some of us saw that the weather was changing and maybe we're waiting to see what was going to happen and waited to prune our roses. We saw that didn't, was not to any detriment to our roses. So instead of sometimes looking at a date on a calendar, you can look at what's going on, what's going on in your garden. And traditionally, this is fun, when the forsythia blooms, that's another indicator when to prune your, prune your roses because forsythia isn't, you know, we know one of the first things to bloom in the spring. It means the soil's warming up, things are starting to wake up, and that's a precursor to other plants putting out new growth putting out blooms. And so when you see forsythia, and I actually think this one's at the Bayless Selby house, that's a good indicator of when you can uh, begin to prune your roses. This is a hard prune. And, and the spring you prune your roses back by 50%. You're removing uh, diseased wood or anything that's diagonal or crossing in your uh, shrub or anything that's dead. And we call that, you know, the three Ds, so. Feeding your roses. I feed my roses organically. And uh, <laughs> I, was, I was trying to narrow this down. I thought, well, maybe someone had some more ideas or input that I could talk about. There are so many articles of, out there about uh, feeding your roses. I'm sure it's the same with feeding your garden, uh, but, you know, any perennials that you have. This is what I use in my garden. When you, after you prune your roses and they start showing growth, traditionally that's when um, rose growers will start feeding their plants. I typically kind of, so I use an organic uh, method. I'll put my organic compost out there at the same time when I'm working in the garden. Sometimes it goes on when I've, right after I prune my roses and sometimes it goes on, hmm, you know, when the roses are blooming, sometimes it goes on, it goes on when I get to it. But I really like cotton burr compost, which you can purchase from box stores. Um, it, it is acidic and roses do like a slightly more acidic soil. 
and this can work also as a type of mulch. It doesn't take much. You can put some around the base of each plant. So um, maybe that's something you tried or hadn't tried. And if you've tried it, you can uh, let me know um, the success or what works, how it works in your garden. Throughout the season, occasionally I'll give a fish seaweed mix, uh, a liquid feed to my roses. This can sometimes be done as a um, foliar feed done early in the morning. Um, sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I do a, a root feed. But um, once again, an organic item, I can feed my roses. Sometimes I make compost. Uh, I adhere to the Felder rushing <laughs> method of composting, which is make a pile, leave it there because eventually it'll become compost. So I don't work real hard at the compost, but I do uh, like to save my organic materials and at least it's, it's composting out there on its own. I do use mulch, I use shredded leaves or shredded hardwood mulch around my plants. This helps our roses just like it helps the other plants in our garden by um, retaining moisture and temperature of our, our soil. So those are the things I use to feed my roses. And I don't even do much of this and still I get beautiful blooms from the type of roses that I use and grow in my garden. Let's talk about fall pruning. I'm actually glad that I'm talking in June because this or July here because that gives us time to start thinking about what we need to do to prepare for our fall blooms. And in the fall pruning is not as uh, harsh a prune as uh, our early spring pruning. Remember we talked about when we do that, that's it by 50%. Fall pruning is done by 30%. We're readying our plants to, we're tidying them up after it can be some of their crazy summer growth. We're cutting them back, getting them ready because roses bloom on new wood for that those blooms that will come in September and October. So don't forget, this simple printing gets us ready for what we like to call in Texas, North Texas, our second spring. Print them back by a third, and you can do that in early or mid-August. I've done it as late as late August, but this gives them four to six weeks from when you prune them to develop growth that will then develop those buds and uh, blooms that we like in the fall. So put that on your calendar. I'll go back a second. So put that on your calendar. Tell yourself in August, I'm gonna prune back my roses. So I'll have some great starts for blooms for this fall. We'll cover rose diseases. Now, just like many of the plants we have in a garden, you know, you can plant something in your garden that's it's, it's prone to attract certain diseases in this, and uh, our roses is actually, we can plant varieties that are resistant. They're resistant to powdery mildew. They're resistant to black spot and canker. And I, that's definitely what I recommend in a lot of varieties that I grow. So I don't really see these diseases in, in my garden because the varieties that I have are resistant to them. But you might, maybe, or maybe even if uh, they're resistant to them, if when we have unusual weather, like we had this spring when we had all our rain, and um, there were more chances for powdery mildew and black spot. And these are all fungal diseases. And there are organic fungicides you can use to treat your roses. But actually, when the weather warms up, these diseases tend to uh, disappear, dissipate. So black spot will go away. And fungal diseases are one of the reasons that we Clean our, clean our tools when we're working from one plant to another or from one garden to another garden because fungal diseases can be transferred by your, um, your tools that you're using the garden. So be sure and disinfect your tools when you're working in uh, your garden. And as a, as, and kind of as a habit, we can still do that with viral diseases, even though viral diseases are not spread by our tools. They're spread um, typically by a host. And it was interesting because I hadn't really looked at Rose Mosaic, but I've heard several talks about it lately. It's not in our area. Doesn't mean it can't happen. But viral diseases are diseases that can't be treated. So not just the dreaded Rose Rosette disease, but Rose Mosaic are ones that 
when your rose becomes infected, the best thing to do is to remove that rose so it doesn't spread and your rose is not going to recover because uh, it's infected with a virus. We'll talk very briefly about rose rosette disease. One of the, the best things to do in your garden, especially if you have several roses, if you find rose rosette disease, is take out your infected rose before it spreads. And we'll look at this uh, chart of early symptoms of rose rosette disease. On the upper right, we have distorted sepals. The buds don't look right. The sepals around it are just deformed. And so, you know, this is early. We all know what witch's broom, hopefully, we, well, hopefully, or I don't know if that's a good thing or not. If we know what it looks like, it means you've seen it. So these are early symptoms. And if you can, this is the time to take out your roses before the virus spreads. Uh, below this distorted sepals, we see uh, strapped leaves, another distorted uh, symptom of rose rosette. If you look at those leaves, they're located in the middle section compared to the leaves there on the bottom section of the plant, you'll see a, a big difference in how, um, you know, the nice oval leaves are at the bottom and the ones at the top, they're skinny, they're deformed. So something's not right. They're not growing right because of the virus. On the left, misshapen flower buds, you'll see buds are, are they're not opening, they're not performing, they're not showing uh, the true form of roses that we're used to. That is another symptom. And on the bottom right, when you look at the two stems, one on the left, one on the right, you'll see increased thorniness. Now these aren't big thorns. You see a small smattering of uh, thorns on the left, but you can see the increased thorniness on the right, and that's a symptom too. And I've, uh, I've been informed that if you see, you know, one, one symptom, just kind of keep an eye on it. Two symptoms, then it's definitely time to start consider taking it out. And this is, a uh, this is from Dr. Mark Windham, who's done a lot of field research on uh, the symptoms and the spread of rose rosette disease at the University of Tennessee. Hmm. Let's talk about rose pests. What's eating our roses? Well, in the early spring, we have all that nice, juicy, tender new growth. Aphids do like our roses. And thrips like to eat and munch on rose buds. You can walk out and see the like the top third or half of a rose but that's still tight, it's not opening, and it's just gone. These are, pests also are um, things that just tend to go away once the weather starts heating up in the summer. But we want our roses. We, we want, when spring comes, we're excited to see them. We want to have nice, pretty roses. And it's purely by lazening gardening that this is one way that I treat aphids. This is a plant that you can look at that and go, that kind of looks like a dandelion and it's related and it's sow thistle. And, and play, times in the past, there's, I've had these sprout up in the garden and I thought they were interesting. They're kind of funny. And, um, you know, I hadn't got to the point where I was really, really yanking out everything and I left a few of them. And when I was looking at these before I was taking them out, they were covered in aphids. And I started thinking, well, this is covered in aphids, but my roses aren't. So these plants in a way were attracting aphids. They, they like this much better. This is a smorgasbord for them more so than my roses. You can see the clustrum there on the center stem, but along the leaf on the right-hand side, you'll see the little white exoskeletons because something's been mentioned on those aphids. So it attracts the aphids, then it attracts the predators that eat them. If you continue up to the stem to the right, you'll see kind of a little black outline. So that's an insect and it's the ladybug larvae. They just camp out there, they eat. So it's a win-win. I have aphids on this plant, not my roses, and I attract nat uh, natural predators. Um, you know, if someone's coming over, you can, <laughs> you, can, you can pull it out very easily. They're very shallow rooted and Yes, they do spread a little bit in the spring, but once again, they're easy to pull out. I just think it's kind of interesting to see how this uh, has kind of evolved into a natural way of aphids not being an issue on my roses. Some folks though, if you have aphids on your roses, you can, um, some people just take their finger and kind of squish them since they're soft bodied. And other folks will take a, you can take a squirt a spray of water and just spray them off. So, so what other bit of rose benefits? So when I, by not spraying my roses, beneficial insects can enjoy them. 
and I walk out and, and this is uh, mostly in the fall, I'll see these circles. And I think it's just like, a, it makes me smile when I see it because I know there are cutter bees that are, you know, taking parts of leaves uh, for their nest. And that makes me happy. It makes me realize my garden's organic, that nature is doing its thing. And um, I, I, don't, I don't look at it as unattractive, but as something that's fun to see. Uh, pollinators can visit the ones of my roses that have higher uh, buds and they can access the pollen. And even the ones that are closed and they can't reach the pollen, sometimes I'll find uh, bees tucked in having a nap. They're just chilling, hanging out in the roses on a fluffy, fragrant bed. So let's discuss a little bit and um, I'm going to talk about the old garden roses, whoops, sorry about that, that do well in North Texas gardens. We'll start out with China roses. And I really like um, this chart here because when we think of roses, we think, oh, it's this one group. It looks like it's this, it's nice and neat tucked into this category, but we'll see their variations in each category and the shape and size. Now, if you look at two and three in my garden, um, I, I know my husband would love to have number three because those are so cool. If you have the space for it, you can have a very large rose with, uh, from the China, China group. But me, I'll go for <laughs> size number two because I'm gonna have two of those in place of one of the threes. And also it looks, when you look at these, you can see that, well, maybe number two would do better in a container than the variety that gets the size of number three. China roses are twiggy shrubs. Their um, stems go every which way. They zigzag kind of back and forth. And when you trim chinas in the in spring, or early spring, I keep saying early spring, February 14th, they're typically much easier to prune with the pruning shears because it's a shrub. Varieties of china roses that do well here are Mutabulus, uh, Duché, Cremoise Superior, Archduke Charles, Martha Gonzalez, Hermosa, and Oblesh. And many times when I go out to prune these roses, they're already blooming, they haven't stopped. Um, but you, you trim them back to give them all a nice even look and to get ready for that spring flush of blooms. Here's Hermosa, my garden, and it is a three by three. So like I said, I like those smaller varieties that can fit in more. It's repeat blooming with an upright growth. These little blooms are, have kind of that bluish pink color and pretty globe shaped flowers. And the blooms actually are about two, they're smaller, they're two and a half inches across. So they're like a tiny little um, old garden rose and they're very pretty. You see these date back to 1832. So Hermosa. I have this actually planted more at the front of my bed, which I do like having those roses so I can access them easier if you know, I'm cutting them to bring in the house. This is Napoleon, a repeat blooming. It has a different form. It's much more loose, long petals. And it starts out light and a tight form you see on the left. And as it ages, it gets a little darker and opens up to this loose form. The first time I saw Napoleon was uh, in a talk by Peggy Martin. Uh, it's, it's always one of those things of, uh, it's not garden envy, it's garden education. You see a rose that someone else has and you're like, oh, I'd like to have that one. So I, I think of Peggy when I, <laughs> when I, not only when I see uh, a Peggy Martin in the garden, Peggy Martin Rose, but also my Napoleon. Upright grow three by three of China from Le Fay in France in 1835. So once again, a smaller rose, I have it at the front and behind it, I have a, a interspersed with some grasses and with some salvias. I like to mix it up. Martha Gonzalez is a small bloom about two and a half inches across. It's a repeat blooming, it has that nice bright red color. It pops with that little, circle of white in the center and it gets tall and more so than wide and, and I had this in a container for quite some time and it's a found rose uh, when you see the the quote marks around the name that means it's a working name so Martha Gonzalez was uh, the gardener and uh, was the owner of the garden that this rose was found from by the Texas Rose Wrestlers there's actually I think a story on their website about how this was found. There was a member from the Houston area and a member from the Dallas areas that were uh, 
that Martha had said was sharing um, rose cuttings with. And this was one that they took from her garden. And there's a picture of Martha Gonzalez and that's in the Texas Rose Rustler uh, book written by Greg Grant and William Welch. And Martha is in her bathrobe, she's out in her garden. And I'm thinking Martha is our kind of people. We are, <laughs> we are the gardeners that are ready to go in the morning. We're out in our PJs or our robes, taking care of our plants. And so I, I think of Martha as a kindred spirit. And when you look at this rose, 1829, and yet here it is as a pass along plant that is now in a, you know, a South Texas garden. I just think that's amazing. I love that uh, it's named for this formidable gardener and, and who was gracious enough to share her plants. Tea roses, we're gonna go ahead and continue to the next variety. And our chart once again shows the wide variety of uh, small shrubs, upright, and then spreading roses. These roses, like China's, came from uh, Asia, from China, as did the tea roses. These are traditional roses that do well in our warm climates in the south. And the, these also bloom year round, and they push, push a lot of growth, and they're strong growers, and they do great in our southern gardens. One of the things they have um, is they have, they're known for their beautiful new growth. So even in the spring before we get our blooms and that new growth is coming out, sometimes it will be, which, you know, I think sometimes as new rose uh, gardeners, we don't always think about, but they have that beautiful new growth. Sometimes it'll be burgundy or it'll be uh, orange or coppery orange or even chartreuse. And when we um, see those new colors, it's, it's kind of exciting and it's, a, it's a, a lovely part of the plant that we can enjoy. Some varieties of tea roses are Ver <laughs> Veron Henriette de Snoy, Bons Leon, Maman Cochet, Georgetown Tea, and Safrano. And I was laughing there because I knew this was coming up. This is Rodolog Jules Gravero. Now, um, I was laughing, I, I, this one is actually available when, when they have it in stock from the Antique Rose Emporium. It has a mild fragrance and repeat blooming. This variety was growing at the Rose Gardens of Farmer's Branch. On the upper right, you'll see um, the more tight bloom and the, the quill, tighter quill, pointed quills of, uh, of, of a fresher bloom. And as it ages, you can see it gets looser. The, the form of the, the blooms change a little more to square. I thought it was interesting. It's a four by six T. And um, it has a French name, but the hybridizer, Dr. Joaquin Fontes, is actually from Brazil. And I read a little bit of, about uh, Dr. Fontes, who is a lawyer and a judge, and he hybridized these roses in Brazil from stock from France, and then he would send them back to France. And so he unfortunately passed in the influenza epidemic of 1918, and his wife wrote a biography about his uh, contribution to roses. I think it's in Portuguese, though, so <laughs> I haven't read that. Maman Cochet, fragrant and repeat blooming once again. I, th I think I'm really just kind of drawn to these, these quilled looks of these roses. This one's very loose, um, many petaled, and it's almost quartered at times. And what's interesting is about roses is you know, new blooms, they're tight, and as they loosen up, sometimes we see that more of that multi petaled -petal look. It's a five by five uh, Cochet uh, hybridized it from France. This one also at the Farmer's French Garden, Rose Garden. This is a later bloom of white Maman Cochet, and it's fragrant repeat blooming, and it's a sport of a Moncochet. Some of us know about sports. Sports are a spontaneous mutation from a mother plant. And there's an offshoot that of uh, another type of plant of, of, of that same plant, but in a different color or a different form. And you can cut those sports, propagate them, and then you have a new variety. Sometimes, sometimes over time, uh, if you have something in the ground, it can revert, re revert to its um, host plant. But this is, in the rose world, this is often uh, how we, people say discovered, you know, it didn't mean, doesn't mean they hybridize it, they actually are walking through the, gut, uh, the garden, had a good eye and said, mm, something's a little different there. And uh, 
they, it's, a, it's a new discovery of sport. These actually were discovered, I, I didn't write it down the second one. They were di both discovered in 1896, but one was in Australia and one was in the United States. And there's a, a, a wonderful heritage of growing roses in Australia. And when you get more into roses and look about what grows in Australia many times, those types of roses will do well here in Texas. Monster Tillier is heat tolerant and repeat blooming, many petaled with an upright growth. This is one of the first varieties of old garden roses that I put in my garden. It got very tall. It was, wasn't very wide though. And it was at a time when I didn't really even know much about gardening. I didn't, I didn't amend my soil. I tried to remove the Bermuda grass. I dug a hole, I stuck it straight in the clay. Didn't add any amendment, amendments, didn't feed it. You know, I watered it and it was a trooper. And that was back in 2010 and 2011 in the time of drought and heat. And I walk out there in July and it would still be blooming. It has, it has some pretty serious uh, thorns and it does get big. So sometimes we jokingly call it monster atelier. But even with not knowing anything about roses, this was an excellent variety. I have um, replanted it. I lost it in 2013 to rose rosette disease. And I just planted this also last, it was either October, pro probably November uh, in the ground. And I didn't know how it would do because it hadn't been in the ground very long before uh, winter storm Mary came, but it's doing great. It even uh, survived that. It, it likes a new location. And it has an interesting kind of orange undertone. Some people call it coppery. So when it first comes out, the blooms are rounded. They slowly become quartered and then quilled. And then in the bottom right, it's like a quilled pom-pom. So you'll see this is after that cutoff date of 1867, but its parentage uh, makes it a tea, tea rose. Another uh, tea rose, I think this is one of my husband's favorites is Mrs. Dudley Cross. It's heat tolerant, repeat blooming, many petaled. It's upright and spreading. And it is probably the largest rose I have in my garden right now. And a seven by seven. And the picture on the right, you can see the bloom in the front and you can kind of see the rose form in the back. It gets really tall and it's loose and open and airy. You can see all the blooms in that. And this is actually, I don't know if that's a spring picture or a fall picture, but it, um, it blooms prolifically in the spring. It blooms prolifically in the fall. Now this, of all my teas, this is the one that probably took, uh, that had more dieback from the cold in February. And, you know, it was seven foot tall, but it's already back to four feet tall, but I did have more canes to remove as it did not like that cold snap, but still it survived and I still have beautiful blooms from it. This is the picture I had in my opening title page of Mrs. Dudley Cross. It makes a beautiful cut flower and these blooms actually came in the fall. So sometimes people think that second fall bloom will have a, um, you won't have as many blooms as you do in the spring and not so with this one. It has that cream and then that pink edge. It's, it is a lovely rose with a light fragrance. Polyantha roses. This is a nice variety. You can get, you know, like look at that number one. You can have two or three of those, <laughs> but you can enjoy all varieties. But this is, it, once again, interesting to see how they're spreading and they're upright or even very upright. So polyantha roses are hybridized from species roses and they're a clustering form um, of particularly the Rosa multiflora, the species rose, and they're hybridized with the china and tea roses. Poly means many, antha means flower. So you'll have a beautiful shrub that grows up with many flowers on the, on the end. They're very pretty. This is one of my Australia roses from a hybridizer, hybridizer Alistair Clark. He hybridized as a hobby 
And, um, but his roses, even though it's over a hundred years ago, are still uh, enjoyed and uh, used in gardens. So it's repeat blooming, it's an upright growth. So it's taller than it is wider and it has an, kind of that coral color, which I also enjoy in roses. It has a yellow button eye. And if I look at my window, it's blooming right now. Uh, Madame Cecile Brunner. Uh, it's a repeat blooming fragrant rose that is a three foot by three foot shrub. Now, um, it's very important. <laughs> there is a climbing version of Cecile Brunner that um, is not three foot by three foot. It has canes that grow 20 feet to 30 feet long. So when you're buying this rose, you know, make certain you're getting the right variety, whether you want the, the shrub or the climber. I've had uh, the climbing version of this rose and it forms the most perfect little blooms. And uh, it kind of is known also as a sweetheart rose. They're fragrant. They are so pretty. And um, they're, they're great to gather and to, to use uh, in, in bouquets. This one came from Duché in the late 1800s. What's interesting when I was looking up um, the hybridizers of these, uh, this is actually a woman hybridizer, Marie Duché. And uh, the VVE is VEV, is abbreviation for that, which means she was a widower. But I, the, I thought that was exciting because I hadn't really heard that much from um, women that did hybridizing. It was a hybridizing family. Joan d'Arc, this is a variety, once again, found at the Rose Gardens of Farmers Branch. I wanted to show this bright white. It's very pretty with a loose form, repeat blooming, spreading growth. And it's from uh, France at the turn of the 20th century, white to cream blooms with a slight fragrance. This is this past spring. It was just floriferous, so many blooms. And if you like white and something bright uh, in your garden, or maybe you have a white section of your garden, this would be a lovely one to consider. This is one of my newer polyethas. Um, I guess both in the date and the date of purchase. I purchased this from the Antique Rose Emporium, it repeat blooming. This is one stem. It, it makes a perfect uh, cluster of blooms that you can put in a container and it's just very charming. You just cut off one stem and there it is. You can put it in a vase in a little pitcher. Uh, it's, it's not very big, but it's quite lovely. The shape of the roses are very rounded and you can see the variation of color in them. This is one of my favorites, current favorites. You know, that kind of changes, right? As to what's in bloom uh, and what you enjoy. It's a polyantha from 1931, three foot by three foot. So small rosette blooms from this one. We'll talk a little bit more, uh, go over some roses from Texas hybridizers, because I wanted to do shout out since you know, we're talking about North Texas, about those folks that hybridize roses, uh, Dr. Dr. Basie, who was a professor of mathematics at Texas A&M University, Mike Shoup, the owner of uh, Antique Rose Emporium, and Ray Pont Ponton, uh, who is a, was a member of the Texas Rose Wrestlers. And you'll recognize some of these varieties and maybe you'll say, hey, I didn't realize those were from hybridizers that uh, hybridize them in Texas. Basie's Blueberry is a, an open, a single form, uh, that I really enjoy in my garden. It makes beautiful hips in the fall. So if you like to use rose hips in decorating or interested in collecting seed or making rose hip jelly, I have never done that. But this is from 1968. And the pink has slight blue undertones, which makes, when you first just look at it by itself, if you hold it next to another pink, you'll definitely see more bluish look to it. And Basie's purple. And this this photo shows the beautiful shape and form of this rose, which is a hybrid rugosa, but it does not show its color that well. It's a much deeper velvety purple. It's very difficult to photograph or even try to, to edit to give it the right color. It's a very pretty variety from 1968. Belinda's Dream, maybe many of you have grown Belinda's Dream and my blooms on Belinda's Dream were, were huge this year. They were like four to five inches across with all that, uh, um, water and rain we had they did great i actually the two i currently have are in containers so even though it's a tall rose 
you can uh, prune it and uh, keep it in a container. I've had success with that from 1988. Pioneer series is uh, some of the roses that uh, Mike Shoup has done. This is Thomas Affleck. I like it so much. I have two varieties. And it's actually in its parentage has one of Dr. Basie's roses, uh, uh, Basie's blueberry. So you see some of that, maybe those purple undertones in this variety. It's an upright grower. Uh, that's currently what I have behind me. It's it's blooming. It, it It's just been doing gangbusters this year. And I cut a huge stem and you can see some of the blooms as, a, as it gets older, a looser form. Anyway, so that's what's there. Um, also in the Pioneer series, this is Star of the Republic. I brought this one in because some of the trends we see maybe on social media are some of these buff colors. And this is a real pretty, uh, peachy apricot and it's a medium to strong fragrance. It's a very pretty form. And when I was looking at this picture first, you know, I'm just looking at the rose, but now I'm looking at it and I wanted to briefly say that this photo, it's, what, what, is, what is this? It's got a label, it's in a container. These were taking, taken at an event that's held at the Antique Rose Emporium every fall, Festival of, Rose, uh, Festival of Roses held the first September excuse me, I'm getting all excited, held the first Saturday in November. And some team or individual goes and collects roses and places them on a table. And it's all the fragrant, it's a fragrance table. And you have um, types of roses. Um, actually some newer varieties that are hybrid. And I said my internet was unstable, so I was just double checking that. So, um, but you can go around and view, you can kind of see in the background, I, all the different roses, you can see the difference in fragrance, whether it's fruity or maybe it has a, a, a hybrid musk scent or whether it has cloves or, or, or. So that's a wonderful event where they have speakers. It's a free event. Uh, you can visit their website. Once again, that's the Festival of Roses, the first uh, Saturday in November. I want to mention this one because it's one of my favorite varieties in my garden because each bloom is different. It has this striped look. It has this open single bloom and really pretty anthers. And this was uh, by Ray Ponton in uh, 2005. It's upright growth. It's about five by five. And I took a picture of it as it opened throughout the day as because it you know starts out the pink and as it opens the pinks kind of lighten and then show white when it's uh, open completely. Talk a little bit about modern shrubs. There's a, a group of hybridizers in Europe from Germany, the Cordis family, which is which has been in the nursery and hybridizing business for over 130 years. And they've always been kind of ahead of the game, I think, of what consumers want, and at least uh, what I want. So this is Cream Veranda. I actually purchased this, I think, from a member's rose cell, Master Gardeners. That I love that little form. The, the leaves are pretty uh, green color. It does not have a lot of fragrance but in it, but it is a, a small shrub, fits in a small area. This would be a good uh, variety to have in a container. There's a whole veranda series. I know someone, uh, I think it was Janie that's been posting pictures of her brilliant veranda, same series uh, that was introduced by Cordis. So check out uh, other varieties of verandas. Some more Cordis roses, there's South Africa. I like this one for the color and the globe form. Uh, there are other varieties, Plum Perfect, which is a lovely purple, Purple Rain, which is another lovely purple uh, variety. Ruby Ice, we sold a lot of this spring a red rose with a white reverse and savannah, a multi petaled kind of peachy pink variety. And actually both these varieties I have in containers at the moment. So let's talk about some rose books. I, I know we're interested in, if you're interested in learning more about roses, you can pick up uh, Empress of the Garden by Mike Shoup, a book about the rose wrestlers and um, 
their their work and collection of roses and how they got started and what they've contributed to antique roses by Greg Grant and William C. Welch. This is the book uh, by T. Roses. This is a, an Australian uh, group of ladies that work together to talk about old roses for warm gardens. This is an older Mike Shute book uh, co-written uh, with Liz Druitt, Landscaping with Antique Roses with great information on uh, rose care and varieties. And uh, the, this wonderful book by uh, Dr. Welch, Antique Roses for the South, and Liz Druitt's other book, uh, The Organic Rose Garden. There are lots of rose books out there, but these are some of my favorites. So if you want to visit rose gardens in our, our area, please take uh, time to visit the rose gardens of Farmers Branch, our, the rose gardens in Chambersville Tree Farm. They have several gardens there. Uh, you can visit the gardens at the uh, display gardens at the Antique Rose Emporium and the display gardens at the Tyler Rose Gardens in Tyler, Texas. The wonderful thing about every one of these gardens is they're all free to visit. Another great uh, resource for finding more about roses is Help Me Find. Uh, so you can type in the name of a rose, afterwards type in Help Me Find, and it will take you to the page. A lot of photos are contributed by um, members. You can, you can sign up and become a member for free and upload pictures of your own roses. They have additional uh, research information that is the paid service and finding out more about nurseries, uh, history and patents. But this is a great resource and they talk about uh, clematis and peonies. So at this time we'll see if there's any questions and um, so but if uh, you don't uh, have we get to your question you can always visit and learn more about roses and oh garden roses on Facebook and Instagram with our group, the Dallas Area Historical Rose Society. We're also online at antiqueroses.org. I think it's dallasantiqueroses.org. But you can find us. Are there any questions? Anybody have any questions for Sherry? You're welcome to put them in chat or just unmute yourself and shout them out. I'll, I'll pose one that I asked her before we started today. And that was if Winter Storm Fury, our, our cold blast for February had any effect on Rose Rosette disease. I was figuring it didn't since it was a virus, but Sherry had a good answer for that. <laughs> we were hoping it was just gonna knock them all out, but it, 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 it didn't. Um, those roses really want to live. What happens is rose rosette does weaken a plant and left unchecked, eventually the plant will die. And, and um, research people say, oh, it'll take two or three years, but that's not what we're finding out is the case here. It's taken a very long time for the rose rosette disease to weaken the plant enough to where it actually finally just succumb. But the freeze, if the plant was very, very weak, then maybe, uh, the freeze took it out, but others it did not. So, what a will to live, right? I know. <laughs> we do have a few more questions that are popping up in chat, Sherry, and I may not pronounce this correctly, but Pam is asking, do you have a mutabilis? Mutabilis. A mutabilis. I I do not. Um, I have friends that have them, and um, it's a great rose. There are actually some slight variations. You know, it's tabulus is talk, the, the butterfly rose is another thing because it metamorphosizes from, it starts out pale yellow, then gets a little darker to a light pink and then to a dark pink. So it's very interesting uh, progression of colors. And there's some varieties that have new, that like we talked about sports, there is a sport, a metabolis that starts kind of apricot color and goes to a pink and then to a dark pink. So. Be on the lookout for that. I don't think it's necessarily in commerce, but you know, these plant people like to share plants. So join those rose groups, find about, find out <laughs> who's growing what plants and uh, people love to share plants. That's that's the hard thing about doing things on Zoom is like, man, it, you can't share plants online. I mean, we're finding ways still <laughs> to share plants, but um, support, you know, your local rose groups and um, those, you know, people love, love to share. Absolutely. And we'll have a little blurb about that coming up at, during the business meeting. 
folks will be excited to hear about that, I'm sure. But a, a, another question, Sherry, in chat from Stephanie, after you removed a plant with rose rosette, can you plant another rose in that spot? Absolutely. <laughs> and that's not just me saying it. Um, if you go uh, on our website, like I talked about, we have rose rosette information. We have the most recent things published from research. We, we look at things that are science-based, you know, education that we can share with people. And, and I showed that little blurb from Dr. Mark Windham. The virus lives in the plant. It does not live in the soil. So the, the mite that can um, be a host for the virus, it can live in the soil for up to three days is what their research has found. So technically after three days, maybe on day four, you could plant a rose, but they say, we're just gonna call it a week because that's easy to remember. So as short as a week after you remove a rose, as long as you removed all the vegetation of that disease rose, you can plant another rose. Now we might be a little gun shy, so you might wanna wait a little longer, but you don't have to wait one year or two years or three years to plant roses. You can plant them back pretty quickly. Super, thank you. And then Debbie's asking in general, what is the best month to plant roses? Just like other perennials, I think fall is the best time to plant. Um, you know, we, we like to plant things this spring because that's when everything's fresh and new. And the roses we put in the ground, actually, they still take off as we're seeing from the members plant cell. Some of those beautiful roses are doing great this spring, but fall is an absolute great time to plant. So. That's another good reason to go to that festival of roses because there's roses for sale. You can bring them home and put them in your fall garden and be ready for next spring. Awesome. And then Randy's also asking if you've ever grown a rambler named Dr. Van Fleet. I have not, but uh, one of the gardens that I mentioned that you can visit for free, it, you can see it there, uh, Dr. Van Fleet. Um, is you can view that particular rambler at the rambler gardens there at Chambersville. So it's in the area. And um, what's it, what, I'm gonna just quick blurb on ramblers. You know, this came from ramblers used to re, be were very popular in the 20s and 30s and they became out of fashion. And when something comes out of fashion, it disappears from commerce. People aren't selling it. And um, a woman in uh, Washington state, Ann Belovich, I think she was, was she in her, 80s or no, anyway she started collecting ramblers she and she put together this huge collection and uh we've replicated that collection has been replicated and they're hosting it at chambersville so these don't disappear well recently on social media perhaps you've heard of floret farm flower you know um they do a lot of seed uh cells and dahlias and zinnias very pretty flowers and stuff big presence on uh instagram they visited, they're nearby where Ann lives. They went and visited Ann, who's now in her late 90s. This woman is just a, a Renaissance woman, has done so many things in her life, and they're going to replicate those roses too. Now, that would be interesting to see if they're going to make them available in commerce. I haven't heard any more, but they're going to replicate those roses. And also, the American Rose Center in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, is going to replicate those roses. So, this is exciting for an old, gold, uh, old, old garden rose person. <laughs> Am I old? No, the rose is no. not. The ro <laughs> a, the not. A, veteran, a veteran garden rose person. Okay. But the, the roses are old. And so that's kind of exciting to see a trend for people interested in these older varieties. It is interesting. Thank you for sharing that. And here's an interesting and fun question. Sherry is asking, would you be willing to give a tour of your rose garden? It might be a fun intern experience. And Sherry's from- Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I actually gave a, a, a garden tour to members of the Dallas Area Historical Rose Society this spring. So many times, and I got to see other gardens. So sometimes when you join these offshoot groups, you get and see, get in other people's backyards and see what they're growing. But I'd love to do that. Um, fall would be a great time. You could see the second spring. You could see what's growing. And sometimes when we see the roses in person, it's so much different than seeing them on this little bitty screen here. So. I would love to do that. So I was just, I actually was thinking about that the other day. My, someone contacted me and wants to see the garden. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> the roses look good, but maybe it needs a little bit of, of work. But 
So I, I do like to open my garden and um, it, you know, contact me anytime. We can set up a group tour. Um, I'm happy to have individuals come visit. So I'd love to see you. Come, come see me in my garden. That might be a fun thing to plan. Joanne said we could have a tea party. All right. <laughs> visit your rose garden. And y'all, Sherry is so generous with her garden. I've never known her to turn down anyone that wanted to come and tour it. So um, Pam is asking Sherry, any recommendations for a rose that would withstand some shade? Well, here's what's interesting. It depends on what kind of shade it is. I actually have roses planted in deciduous shade and they would do better if they had more sun, but they get sun all winter long and they'll do a spring bloom for me. They're very pretty. And then they're kind of a shrub the rest of the year because they're not getting sun. So I've kind of, you know, traded big, beautiful blooms to at least to have some blooms. So you can, can plant many varieties just in deciduous shade. Good, good to know. And then Cheryl's asking, is there a time that is better to try your hand at propagating roses? Oh, propagating. I'm terrible at propagating. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I've talked to other rose growers too. Um, so I'm, I'm not the only one. Typically when you propagate is when the best, you have the best growth on the rose to take. It's not, you don't want woody growth. You want new growth, but not too new. You want about the size of a pencil. So that typically occurs uh, kind of in late spring or in um, you know, early to late fall. So I was, I was talking to a, mem a friend of mine in the Texas Rose Wrestlers just the other day. And there, there are people in her group, she says, they, just, they propagate, but they put it in dappled shade in uh, their garden and under a big tree. She, she goes, I just told them they had a magic tree because they propagate every month of the year. So propagation, as we know, some people are a little more adept at it than others, but you can try it anytime, but I recommend, uh, you know, late spring or, you know, kind of in the fall. Unless you have a magic tree. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think that's all the questions. You had a lot of wonderful comments. Everybody appreciated all that you shared as always. And I appreciate it too. So thank you so much for being with oh, us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. And like I said, I had a two hour talk, but <laughs> well, we'll but look, that just didn't happen today we'll look forward to part two the next time how about oh, that excellent you, you hang on to that we'll look forward to hearing it uh, time. I, I, I have a talk on david austin roses because uh, i love those two so that'll be next time that's good we'll look forward to that thank you sherry oh thank you again good morning can i ask a quick question absolutely Hi, it's Deborah. This was absolutely wonderful. I really, really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. My question is, is this available, your PowerPoint, so that we can go back? I wasn't in a place where I could write down all the names of the roses so that we can refer back to them. Um, am I, I don't even see me. Am I, can you hear me? I can't. Yes. We can. Okay, okay. I'm not muted. I had just uh, taken away my screen. Um, Deborah, uh, I can work on a list of the roses I talked about, and I can post that to um, our Facebook page, or I can make it available. If anyone wants to reach out to me, I can send it to them. So. That would be perfect. Okay. Let me Deborah, make we, we recorded this as well, so within 24 oh, okay. hours, it'll be posted to our Denton County Master Gardener Association YouTube channel. So in case you wanted to watch the replay or go back and reference anything in particular, we should have that up very soon. Oh, that's a good idea too. Thank you. That's the good thing about recording these. <laughs> yes. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't write all these notes down. So wonderful. Thank you. Sure thing. And there are many knowledgeable rose people in our group. So I'm excited that... Um, we do have other rose lovers in our group. So if you ever have questions, I'm, I'm sure post those and many people, we all are, can be experts in like different areas, just like we are with any type of gardening. So um, utilize those folks in our group and uh, plant those roses. Absolutely. So we thank you again, Sherry, and we thank our wonderful programs chair, Beverly Duncan, for booking you for today. Thank you, Beverly, for booking Sherry and all of our wonderful presenters that you've lined up for us.